in church. Good to have you here today. Uh, if you're in the lobby, uh, good to have you too, but we'd like to get you a little closer. Uh, so come on in. We're going to sing this morning. We're going to start off by singing about the lion and the lamb. Of course, both of those phrases refer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's sing out about him today. The lion and the lamb.
Let's continue singing this morning. This song kind of reminds me of when Jesus uh, called Lazarus by name and Lazarus came out of the grave. And this, the idea of this song is he's going to call my name and your name and we'll come out of that grave too uh, because Jesus Christ has the power over our death. So let's sing that song together. out of the grave? Well, the answer to that question is because of love. That's the power of Jesus' love. Let's sing that.
cross of Calvary. So let's sing about that.
Jesus. Morning. Getting together with family at Thanksgiving is a very special tradition. The highlight of the day is an afternoon meal, which we enjoy an abundance of good things to eat and topped off by an assortment of great desserts. The rest of the day is spent watching football and playing family games. It is easy to take for granted such happy times, delicious food, and wonderful company. Those of us who experience them should never forget what blessings they are and how many homes at Thanksgiving are without them. We are indeed wealthy. This communion table is not distinguished by the wide variety of foods one sees on it. It really presents quite a contrast to the tables to which most of us will sit down at Thanksgiving. Here there is no smorgasbord. The fare is simple, this bread and juice. That is because the real hunger being addressed here is not of the stomach, but of the soul. There is not a variety of items from which to choose at the table because we have made our most important choice already to live by faith, not by sight, and to make eternal matters a higher priority than temporal matters. We acknowledge that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. In addition, we are gathered at this table with family, those not born of natural descent nor of human decision, nor husband's will, but born of God, John 1.13. Despite our different earthly parents, we have a common heavenly father. And despite our different places of birth, we have a common destination, heaven. Despite the different goals that we pursue, we have one overriding aim, to be Christ's people every day in every circumstance. Here at the table, we experience a different kind of fullness, a satisfaction that the world cannot provide. As Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty, John 6, 35. For all this table represents, we should give thanks. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we just uh, praise you for the simplicity of this table that you set before us, Father. As we partake of the bread and the juice, we will remember that it is your body and your blood. And Father, we, uh, we praise you for the sacrifice that you made for us at Calvary. And we come before you in prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, grab your bulletin, please. Inside, you have an outline to follow along. Give you a little bit of heads up. Uh, some of this sermon is going to sound familiar from just a few weeks ago, simply because of the topic and the issue that we're going to be dealing with. If you were here a few weeks ago when we went through the book of Galatians, 
Uh, not the same sermon at all, but what Paul hit on in Galatians, we're going to hit on some more uh, from a totally different writer. We're in the book of James, the Lord's brother, not the apostle James. He's dead by this time. He was executed. Uh, we know that from what the book of Acts tells us. This is the, the Lord's brother, James, okay? And so that's what we'll be looking at today, get into some things that might get a little bit deep. So um, let me just, let's say this, uh, I love you more than life itself. That's not me speaking, okay, but that's the young man, what he said to his girlfriend on the phone. For you and you alone, I would climb the highest mountain. I would cross the deepest valley. I would swim the widest ocean. And I'll be over Friday night if it doesn't rain, okay? Now, ladies, I assume that you would much more prefer a man who shows you he loves you than one who simply tells you he loves you. Not that you don't like or want to hear those words, but I think we all understand that all the professions of love in the world don't amount to anything if words aren't backed up by actions. In fact, here's the truth. Most of us judge how much someone loves us, not by what they say about their feelings towards us, but literally by how they treat us. And while we've learned that lesson in our personal lives, many people, and I do mean many, still struggle with a similar issue in their religious lives towards God. According to much of the Protestant world, the non-Catholic world, you would think that God is way more interested in what we say about Him than in what we do for Him. We are saved by faith alone, is what the majority cries out. And they cringe at the suggestion that anything else other than mental belief is required of the Christian. Discipleship, righteous living, Yielding to the Lordship of Jesus Christ all become just so much optional equipment to their one and only essential, and that is this, a disembodied faith. One religious spokesman even went so far as to say this. I'm going to quote. Here we go. <laughs> Here's what he wrote. I want you to see this. It is possible even probable that when a believer out of fellowship falls for certain types of philosophy, he will become an unbelieving believer. Is that even possible? <laughs> an unbelieving believer. But it, it gets worse. Yet believers who become agnostics are still saved. They are still born again. I would just take that word again off and just put they're still born. Because that's about what it amounts to. But they're still born again. Look what he says. You can even become an atheist. But if you once accept Christ as Savior, you cannot lose your salvation, even though you deny God. I know what some of you are thinking. What Baptist preacher wrote that? I got news for you. When I got online for that church to see what it was, it says an independent Christian church. Hmm. Do you know how many scriptures that very last statement breaks? Even though you deny God. Why is it so difficult for us to accept the fact that God is at least as smart as we are? Would you agree with that? He's at least as smart as we are. He knows... That a person who simply claims to believe is not nearly as desirable as one who shows he believes by the way that he behaves. Folks, Jesus hit on this very thing several times, by the way, but he specifically hits on it in Matthew chapter 28, when he, or excuse me, Matthew 21, verse 28, when he says this, what do you think? Man had two sons. He went to the first and he said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and he went. He went to the other son. He said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? See, folks, words are cheap when it comes to relationships. You know that, and I know that. I think God knows it. We believe that, except when it comes to our relationship with God. Actions speak louder than words. Is is just as true in your religion as it is in your romance. All right, let's get into the text today. James chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14. Read several passages here, read several scriptures. Here's what James writes. 
What good? And by the way, I just want to give you a heads up on this. James, when he writes this, and you're going to see this, I'm not adding to it, you're going to see this. He's frustrated. And uh, he uses sarcasm in this passage we're going to look at because I think he's pretty upset with the people he's writing to. But look what he says in chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Uh, let me add a little bit of stuff right here, okay? You believe that God is one? Ooh. <laughs> That's kind of what he's doing here, because look what he says. You believe God's one? Ooh. You do well. Even the demons believe. You hear the sarcasm? You believe? So what? Even the demons believe. And what's their reaction? They shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Stop the press. You have surely heard that term before, faith alone. And I can almost guarantee that when you've heard it, that is how you are saved, by faith alone. Faith alone has become a mantra for most religions. What is interesting is that those two words, the only time in the entire Bible, Old or New Testament, the only time that those two words are used together is right here. Look what it says. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. You know, we need to ask God for forgiveness. I do. Probably you do. Probably several million other people do too. We will, we, we non-Catholics, boy, we'll nail the Catholics for uh, their teachings, especially when it is expressly contradictory to Scripture's. For example, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says doctrines of demons are what? Those people who forbid marriage and tell you to abstain from certain foods. Exactly what the Catholic Church does, right? I'm not going to argue that. They, for, they forbid marriage of the priesthood. And if you're a Catholic, you're not supposed to eat certain foods, especially meat on Friday. And boy, we'll nail them for that. You guys are going against what the Bible says. Absolutely. Then the non-Catholics will turn right around and say, just like this guy that we read earlier, once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're in grace, you're always in grace. What's Paul saying in Galatians chapter 5? You foolish Galatians, you have fallen from grace. I don't know how much plainer you can get. You have fallen from grace. You're saved by faith alone. Uh, the only time that's ever shown in scriptures is right here. And what's it say? Not by faith alone. Do you see the problem? We're quick to point out the problems of other denominations, other religions, and then we'll turn right around and we'll make excuses for doing the very same thing. Let me keep reading. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead... So also, faith apart from works is dead. Now, before I get into the meat of this sermon, I didn't even know where to fit this in, but I really wanted to... I, I think we're out of this. This, this, is the, this is a little periodical that we have every month. We don't have that many. We always sum right back there by the prayer thing, and you guys grab them, which is what we want you to do. This is for the month of September, October. 
And it was a, it was a two-part article. If you can see it, the tyranny of the paradigm, not a very catchy title, I'll admit. But probably the best article I've ever read on what I'm talking about right now. And so I'm just going to tell you this. I've written this place before and asked them to make copies, and they always agree to that. If you haven't read this or want to read it and you don't have it, I'll make copies for you. I'll, I'll, I'll make copies for you and then ask for forgiveness from the company, okay? But it is, ignore the title, although he, it makes sense when you read it. But, I mean, he hits on this. Everybody needs to read this. The relationship between faith and works has been a heated discussion, folks, down through the centuries, at least since the 1500s, especially from the Reformation on. Between churches have argued, and we still do today, and individuals argue, and we still do today. And yet the Bible gives us a very honest and open picture of what we're talking about if we'll just pay attention and read the Bible and let it speak for what it says, not try to add to it or take away from it. James shares two things with us in the scriptures that we just read to show us the relationship between faith and works. James gives us on your outline, number one, he gives us a description of faith that is divorced from works. And he uses actually several illustrations to show us, guys, if you have faith but you're not backing it up, here, here's where you're at. Specifically from verses 14 through 20, he gives us several descriptions of a faith that's been divorced from action. Letter A, James says that faith unaccompanied by good behavior is devoid of value. There's no value to say you have faith and not know anything about it. That's what he's saying. Matter of fact, here's what he says. What good is it, my brother, if a man professes to have faith and yet his actions do not correspond? Can that faith save? And the obvious answer that James is looking for is a resounding, no, it cannot. Professing a faith does not mean you have a faith. And there's no value in just professing. One reason being is it cannot save you. Folks, luckily for James, Jesus agrees. Did you know that? <laughs> Jesus plainly says in Matthew, and other places, let me just pick Matthew 7, 21, Sermon on the Mount. Here's what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But look what he says. He who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. That is the Son of God saying that. Apparently these people that Jesus was talking about, they had some sort of faith because they called him Lord. But it was a faith that was not backed up by action. And so he asked this question. If all you say is, Lord, Lord, and do nothing, are you doing the will of the Father? And the answer is no. You're not going to get into heaven. That's what he says. Who's going to get to heaven? Those who do the will of my Father. Another reason that faith without works is devoid of any value is because it provides no benefit to anyone. If a brother, I'm going to read scripture here. If a brother or sister have no clothes or food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warm, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for the body. What use is that? Aiden gave you a prayer request this morning, Jerry, and you prayed about this, the poor. And we need to pray about that. Let's say we walk out this door earlier today, or later today, and we have a chance to help someone, and we don't. What good's your faith? What good's that prayer? True? That's what James is getting at here. It is of no value. What other principle allows someone to prove their faith in the absence of behavior? How do you prove your faith without any behavior? You can't. There is no other principle involved here. That's what James is getting at. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith, what? By my works. Letter B, James goes on to say that faith not demonstrated in conduct is dead. It's dead. Here's what he says. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. It is a corpse. There's no substance. There's no life. There's no vitality. There's no action. Someone might say, well, is it not possible that someone has a gift of faith, another gift of action? Could there not be this diversity among those who are members of the same body? And James answers out, no. <laughs> Can't be that way. Demonstrate faith without some action. Show me this thing that you call faith without pointing to some kind of behavior or conduct. Can you do it? No. 
We have misconstrued the word faith down through the years so much that we've almost lost the true meaning of faith. And I hope that we can gain some of it back today as we look at biblical examples of faith. But folks, what I want us to realize right now is that biblical faith implies action. And when we try to separate the two, we are left with some intangible philosophy that no one can get a handle on. It's dead. James 2, 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Letter C, James nails it to the wall with his third description of faith, separated from works. Here it is. He says it's demonic. James 2, 19, you believe that God is one. <laughs> you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Now, folks, James is not implying, and neither am I, we're not implying that a person who only believes in the Lord and does not act upon that is their demon possessed. That's not what he's saying. That's not what I'm saying. But here's what he is saying. If all you do is believe in the Lord and that's where it stops, you are no better off than the demons. Do you catch that? You believe that God's one? Even the demons believe that. So how are you any better off than the demons? Answer, you're not. Satan and his angels believe in God. They know he exists, folks. The demons were some of the first to recognize and proclaim Jesus Christ. Remember that? Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 1. He had to tell them to be quiet. Why? Because he was not ready to be revealed yet as a son of God, and they were doing it too early. Shut your mouth. <laughs> be quiet. It was the demons he was telling that to. But they do not have a faith in God to cause them to act accordingly. By the way, that word that James uses for believe and referring to the demons is the exact same word Jesus uses in John 3, 16. So don't even try to get out of that. Well, it's a different word there. No, it's not. The exact same word that Jesus says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believes will have eternal life, is the same word that James uses right here when he says, even the demons believe. Folks, demons believe, but they have no other recourse than to tremble and shudder as they wait their inevitable doom. Man, on the other hand, does have an alternative. He can believe that God is one and act upon that belief. He can accept it in faith, the provision that God has made for his sin through the cross. He can and he must demonstrate that acceptance by his obedient behavior. I know that what I'm saying might be hard for some of you, depending on what background of religion you've come out of, because of your upbringing, because of who you've read or listened to. But folks, James is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I know tons of people that do not like reading the scripture we read earlier today. Matter of fact, Martin Luther, the reformer, who caused a lot of problems in this area, and he was a good theologian, but boy, here he messed it up. In his pursuit to get away from the Catholic Church, he went too far. For example... In Romans chapter 3, verse 28, he added a word in his Bible where he says, we're saved by faith alone. And when he translated the Bible from the Greek into German, he added that word, and he was proud of it. And I know why he did if you read his history. Even he didn't buy into what we're doing today, but he still caused a problem by adding that word there when it didn't belong there. And he added that word... And people have bought into that. Oh, look what Romans 3.28 says. Romans 3.28, if your Bible version has the word alone in Romans, or only, the word only or the word alone in 3.28, it shouldn't be there because it's not there in the original. That was added by Martin Luther. Okay? James was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. James has given us some descriptions of faith without works. Okay? Number two on your outline. He now gives us two examples of faith manifested by works. And the first example he gives us is that of Abraham. Now, he only mentions one particular incident in Abraham's life. I want to go to that great faith chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews, and look at a couple of events in the life of Abraham. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8, here's what we're told about Abraham. And, and notice the wording here, folks. By faith, there it is. By faith, Abraham did what? <laughs> obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out. There's the action. He went out. 
not knowing where he was going. God didn't tell him where to go. He just said, get up and go. I'll show you as you're going along. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to that city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He's not talking about earthly city here. He's talking about heaven. It was by faith that Abraham moved from his homeland to a foreign country. It was by faith that Abraham lived out the rest of his life in a tent in a foreign land. Now the incident that James does refer to is also recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 starting in verse 17. And here's that story. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, what did he do? Offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Do you remember the story when you way back when we started the program in Genesis? He was given one son, Isaac. And what does God say about that one son, Isaac? Abraham, through this one son, all of your descendants will come. And I want to tell you something. You're going to have so many descendants through Isaac that they'll be as great as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. That's how great you're going to be. And how's it going to come through? Through your son Isaac. Then some years later, guess what? Isaac, I want to take your son, your only son. I want you to go up here to Mount Moriah. And I want you to, to stab him and burn him as a burnt offering. So with that in mind, let's read this again. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise. What promise? Through Isaac, your descendants are going to come. There's the promise. He received the promise, was in the act of offering up his only son. Hey, at what point in that whole thing did God have to stop him? The boy's tied up. He's on the altar. And what is Abraham doing? Getting ready to put the knife into him when an angel stops him. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Folks, by faith, Abraham obeyed and was actually going to kill his son because he had so much faith he believed God would raise Isaac from the dead if that's what it took to give him back and fulfill the promise. James says that Abraham's faith was perfected through his actions. When God told Abraham to offer Isaac, Abraham obeyed. His faith and his actions were working together, just as God had intended. His faith was made complete. That's what my version says. The real word there is perfected. His, his faith was complete or perfected by what he did. Because he was willing to act, the scriptures can truly say that Abraham believed God. I hesitate to even bring this next topic up because we do not have near enough time to discuss it in the manner that it should be discussed or do it any justice. It's a whole other sermon, but folks, the problem is that it is in direct comparison to what we're looking at here, and I feel obligated to mention it. Many people say that the Apostle Paul and that James are at odds with one another. They say that the Bible contradicts between the book of Romans and the book of James. I told you earlier about uh, Martin Luther. Martin Luther had no regards whatsoever for the book we're looking at today. As a matter of fact, he actually wrote this. You can find this. James is an epistle of straw. <laughs> That's what he thought about the book of James. Why? It didn't fit his narrative from what he had gained knowledge from the book of Romans. Because in, J in, in Martin Luther's mind, Paul and James contradict each other. Now, if you take them out of context, which I'm going to do here, you're going to see how you think that way. Okay? But I want you to stand. That's not what's going on here. But let me read to you. James 2, 23 and 24. Here's what James says. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 2. 
If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Exact word for word quote between James and Abraham, uh, or Paul, out of the book of Genesis, okay? Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. It looks like there's contradiction there. So what do you do? you got to keep them in context. What's being said and who is it being said to? What Paul is talking about in Romans and especially in chapters 3 and 4 about not being justified by keeping the law of Moses. Because no one, either in the Old Testament or New Testament, is justified by keeping a set of rules or a set of rituals. Basically why? Because you can't do it. You make up your own set of rules. Let's just make this real personal. How many of you had made New Year's resolutions? How many has kept it perfectly? It is impossible. We, we, we can't keep rules. Not perfectly. But the Jews were saying, well, you've got to live by the Old Testament law. That's how you get saved. No, the problem there is no one can live. Matter of fact, who was it that said this? You break one point of the law, you break the whole law. Who said that? I'm going to give you a Bible knowledge test right now. Who said that? You break one point of the law, you've broken the whole law. Actually, it wasn't Paul. It's the brother who we're reading today. James. The very one who said, you've got to have works along with your faith. It's also the one who says, hey, keeping the law does no good because you can't keep it. But the Jews that Paul was writing to in Romans were saying, oh, in order to be a Christian, you've got to keep all the laws of the Old Testament. You've got to keep all these rituals. Paul says, no, you're not justified that way because you can't do it. Neither can I. Sooner or later, we will break part of that law. You cannot say, hey, look, Lord, I kept all the rules. Therefore, I deserve to be justified because you didn't keep all the rules. Neither did I. But folks, at the same time, neither does Paul say that faith is just something without any action. As a matter of fact, Paul is just as insistent on faith producing action as James is. We don't want to look at that. I'm going to give you some scripture. You can write them down if you want to. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Romans chapter 16 verse 26. Paul coins a phrase, and here it is. Obedience to the faith. Paul says that. Obedience to the faith. Romans 6.13. Romans 7.4. Romans 8.13. Paul talks about our faith generating action. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. We all know verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, right? It's a gift of God. Okay, but we don't want to read verse 10 where he says that we're created in Jesus Christ to do what? Good works. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Here's what Paul writes, not James. We are to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. In Romans, Paul is dealing with Jews who had this attitude. If I keep the rules, I'll be saved. That's what their attitude was. If I keep the rules, I'll be saved. And Paul says, no, you won't. Because you can't keep the rules. You have to have faith in God that He'll save you. It determines what you do. See, on the other hand, James had apparently the opposite situation. People were saying, we don't need to do anything. As long as we believe, we're good to go. And, and you see that. I, I'm thinking that some of the people he was writing to apparently were just telling people, oh, be warmed, be filled. Go, go on. <laughs> I'm not going to help you. And so they were saying, we don't need to do anything. We're saved. We have faith in God. And James says, wrong. How does anyone know you have faith unless you reveal it through your behavior? What if Abraham had not done what God said? He could still believe in God, yet choose to disobey him. But would that kind of just faith justify him without obedience? The scripture could not have stated that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him. Listen, how do you and I know that Abraham believed God? How do we know it? What was it? He did what he was told. He did it. 
That's how we know Abraham had faith. Because we see in the scriptures that he went ahead and acted on that faith. Abraham was justified not because he said the right words, folks, but because he acted upon his belief. We are justified by faith expressing itself through works. It's not faith plus works. It is your faith at work. That's the faith that's pleasing to God. Another example, this letter B, another example of faith and action that both James and the writer of Hebrews gives is Rahab the harlot. She believed in the living God of the Israelites, and that belief led her to protect the spies that were sent into Jericho. And as a result, she and all her household were saved. Not just a physical salvation here, by the way. I believe at least for her, a spiritual salvation. She's mentioned later in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? What if she had not helped the spies out? What if she had not hung the red cord out her window? She could still have believed in the power of the God of Israel without choosing to risk her own life. But would that kind of faith have saved her from the destruction of Jericho? Rahab showed that she had a living faith when she risked her very life on behalf of God's people. Folks, without the risk, there would have been no saving of Rahab. Okay? Many people live their entire lives with a faith alone theology. Even some who don't think they do actually do. They rely solely on a mental acknowledgement of who Jesus is to justify them, and they ignore scriptures such as John 12, 42, or Acts 19, 2 and 3, where saving faith is connected to action. Abraham and Rahab were not commended for observing ceremony and ritual, okay? Even though I'm sure they did observe those things. They were commended for believing God to the point of obeying God. Abraham risked his future, his reputation, his son's life. Rahab risked her very life. True faith must and will express itself through deeds, through actions, through works. Folks, you can check me out on this. As far as I know, every picture given of Judgment Day, whether it's Jesus telling a parable, and he told several about Judgment Day, or whether it's Paul referring to Judgment Day, guess what's involved? Your action. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for what we've done in this life in the body the deeds we've done, either good or bad. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not do this, did we not do that? I don't know you. Why? Because they didn't do it for the right reason in that case. Does going to church what you're doing right now, does attending, this, does attending this assembly right now, does that save you? Will saved people do what you're doing right now? So what's the difference? Right? Doing what you're doing right now doesn't save you. It doesn't. But if you're saved, you're going to do what you do right now. I don't know how to explain it. I told you this back in the sermon in Galatians. You can have, I said three people, let's just take two people. You can have two people live the exact same life. The, as far as their actions, they live the exact same life. And on the day of judgment, one goes to heaven, one goes to hell. How can that be? It's not just what you do, folks. It's why you do it. Some people go through the motions of being Christian because they think they can hold that against God. Hey, God, I earned my way into heaven. Look what I did. I attended church every week. I fed the poor. I prayed three times a day, blah, 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 blah. And there's the other person who did the exact same thing. Why they do it? Because I love the Lord, period. That's what Paul and James are getting at. They are not in contradiction to one another. Paul was telling people who are going through the motions of doing the work, that's not going to save you. You can't hold that against God. First of all, you didn't do the right thing most of the time. And James is saying, wait a minute, just saying you believe is not good enough. How do we know you believe? You've got to have evidence. By the way, God's going to use that evidence on the day of judgment. 
to point out who lived for him and who didn't live for him. That's what it comes down to. I know you might need to set this out more, and you need to, folks, because there is a huge rift in churches today over what I just talked about. But I'm going to go back to this. Why are the Catholics wrong when they go against Scripture that's plainly taught? And we're not wrong when we go against Scripture. <laughs> Fact and point is, you go against Scripture, you're wrong. Whether you like it or not. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, there's a lot that's been dealt with today from your word. We've looked at a huge chunk of scripture out of the book of James. We've looked at Hebrews. We've looked into Matthew. There's just a lot of scripture. And I know that what we've looked at today doesn't even scratch the surface of probably what needs to be dealt with in this whole situation. But, Father, my prayer is that you would help us to accept what we read from your word. I know that we need to study it out. We need to make sure that we're reading it in context, that we're not misusing it. But when all of that is said and done... If the scripture still is facing us and it's something we don't like, help us to deal with it and just go ahead and do it. No matter what we've heard over the years, no matter what we've seen, Lord, your word is supreme and ultimate. Matter of fact, it even comes with this promise out of Isaiah that the flowers fade and the grass withers, but your word will stand forever. Help us to remember that, that our feelings don't change your word. Our beliefs don't change your word. If something's out of whack, we're the ones that need to review and conform. And we know that can be a struggle sometimes, but we pray, Lord, that if, if we're going to call ourselves your children, we actually will obey as your children. Father, we thank you for this gathering, for those who are here today. Continue to bless us as we, as we go along our way, as we do different things today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.